Welcome to Outlier On Air. Today we are in San Francisco at the home of Style Seat. And we've got founder of Style Seat, Melody McCloskey. Thank you so much for making time for us. Yeah, thanks for having me. We are so <laughs> excited to be in this office. We interviewed you oh, a while ago, months and months, maybe a year ago now on our audio podcast. And you were doing great then. And you've just exploded. I mean, behind this camera is a whole team. I'm looking at a, an entire team of how many people here? We've got 25 in this office. Okay, so 25, it's a great space, open, right in the middle of San Francisco. It's a great vibe. Who would yeah. love to work here? Right, we're right in the colorful part of San Francisco. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we get street cred for being here. Yes, yeah, it's, totally. it's awesome, it's great. There's some great characters on the street, but you walk in and it's just gorgeous. It's a great place to work. So I'd love to know, first of all, tell me a little bit about your background, Melody. Sure. Um, so I have been in the tech industry uh, for, you know, I guess almost 10 years now. Really? Which is sort of crazy. I worked for the most part in um, product, so working okay. with engineers. Before this, I was at Current TV, which mm -hmm. is a television network that was started by Al Gore. It was brought in to okay. help um, them figure out their online video strategy and how they're going to monetize and all the mm -hmm. fun product details around taking television content and putting it on the internet, which was really fun. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then while I was there, I decided to start Style Seed and kind of went right into that. So you, how did you decide to be a founder? I mean, where'd you get the guts to just get out there and be a founder? Well, um, I mean, San Francisco <laughs> helps, right. right? There's a lot of nerds here and a lot of founders here. Um, I think that if I wasn't exposed to it as intensely as I was just by living here, um, I might, you know, it, it, things could have been different, yeah. but I mean, almost every single one of my friends is a founder of a company or, okay. or is early stage. And, um, so a lot of my conversations in my early twenties before I was a founder mm -hmm. was talking about, because it's front of people's minds, like yeah. fundraising and minimum viable product and hiring and, yeah. you know, how to take things to the next level constantly. And it's, Really interesting. Yeah. Um, I think technology is the most extensible and scalable thing that you can leverage to build almost any type of idea, um, and and so it's it's pretty interesting yeah. industry. I think so. You're just immersed in it, and you yeah. have the resources. I mean, it's amazing the resources that are accessible just by being here and just being integrated into kind of the startup culture. Yeah. How did you make that leap into your startup, and was it just a success? I mean, how did you get the funding? Oh yeah, about day that? one it was a success. <laughs> it's just been great, easy. Um, no, so we. I guess I sat on the idea for a couple of years. Um, okay. but to me, this. The idea of style seat was so obvious and something that was so needed that I kept thinking, you know, well, I want to do this, but someone smarter than me is probably already working on it, or I really want to do this, but, but, you know, it's going to be hard, and I bet there's at least three companies that are being started that are similar, and got to a point where I became, I was just so obsessed with the idea that the excuses started to fade away. Mm -hmm. It was like I'm more obsessed. And I feel more of a desire to do this than fear of failure. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that, that was, I literally woke up and had that thought, I actually don't care if this doesn't succeed anymore. I have to do it. I can't live and not do this. And that's what they say. They say some, some entrepreneurs say, don't be an entrepreneur unless you just have to, unless you just can't not do it, right? I mean, there are some dark times. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. It's incredibly hard. Um, both physically and emotionally, but it's also really rewarding. So tell me a little bit about Style Seed, just for those who haven't seen you. Know, you've been interviewed by some great entities besides us, but I'd love to know, you know give us a little bit, a little rundown on what Style Seed is. Sure, so we are the largest and fastest growing marketplace in the beauty services industry. So it's really two things. One, we're a business platform and a tool for hairstylists and salons to better run and grow their business. Okay. We grow their revenue on average 70% in the first year just by making things run more smoothly. And then on the other end, because we have 250,000 businesses in 15,000 cities in the U.S., mm -hmm. we're a great resource to discover, book, and pay for beauty appointments online or from your phone. So if, if I, let's say I'm a, I've just graduated from beauty school mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, whatever my specialty is, can I, 
Is it a SaaS type of a thing where I can just sign up on Stylesheet, I can have my portfolio and book appointments on Stylesheet? Is that how it works? We're actually free. So oh, really? Yes. Okay. For We want to be helpful for any player in the beauty space. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a brand new student or you're a stylist that's doing incredibly well or you're a high-end celebrity stylist, Rodney Cutler in New York, for example, is on the style seat. Mm -hmm. okay. we, we have free tools for you. So it could be just a free website to help you build buzz and grow your business and grow your online community. Okay. Or we can run your entire business soup to nuts for free. Really? You know, we do Accounting, everything. everything. Yes. We help wow. you with your taxes and with all your finances oh. and payments and all that stuff. Oh, excellent. So how do you monetize that? We have a freemium platform. Okay. So it's 100% free to run your business. If you want extra fancy scheduling and marketing tools as a stylist or mm -hmm. as a salon owner, then we have packages that on average are 30 bucks a month. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So you can just get started for free and kind of merge into it. Exactly. So tell me about how big Style Seat has gotten because of course the power with a platform like that is the number of users really, right? So tell me how expansive is it? Yeah, so there's three million people that use Style Seat today. As I mentioned, we have um, hundreds of thousands of stylists and salons that are using it. L'Oreal, we've just announced a relationship with them where we are the preferred partner they're recommending us to you know they're in 70 percent of salons in the u.s so we're really excited about that um they're really excited about the fact that we're free and we have a great tool that helps their customers these salons and spas be more prosperous and more successful mm -hmm. um, and also is a great consumer experience for the clients as well so those let's say i'm moving to a new city and mm -hmm. i'm a client uh, is this the best way to find that new hairstyles because that is the bane of my existence going oh to my a gosh. new city or i'm visiting a city and i actually call you know i call salons and i don't have a recommendation so i call salons and i say hey do you have like a portfolio or yeah. something where i'll know and yeah very rarely do they have that it's true so is this the answer <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and what I wanted, like the reason why I started the site is, I mean, I'm a nerd, I'm mm -hmm. data driven. Like I want to know who's the best hairstylist mm -hmm. within a couple of neighborhoods who focuses on curly hair and right. short color, hair, right? Yeah. Who's in my price range. I mm -hmm. want to see photos of their work. You know, if I'm going to get, let's say if I want to get ombre done, I want to see photos of the ombre that that stylist has done mm -hmm. so that I can get a real, a real feel for their style right. because there's so many different styles out there, as we all know, and we've all had horrible hair color yes, done. Yes, we have. You've been in great places. It's, it's so <laughs> traumatizing that that actually happened to me a couple of times in a row. And I, you know, in San Francisco, cut and color is over 300 bucks. It's pretty expensive. And I was like, I paid you know, over a thousand dollars at this point, Right. there has to be a better way to find someone yeah. who's good for what I want. So tell me, um, what, you know, what was the, the process like to build, this is actually a tech solution. I mean, mm -hmm. you're a tech company. Um, so as, as you jumped in and started to build it, did you start bootstrapping? Did you get funding right away? What yeah. avenue did you pursue that? Oh God, um, let me tell you how, easy it is to raise money in 2010 for a hair startup. <laughs> we had a lot of a lot of very polite and kind of no thank yous from ACs. So I mean I there's nothing that was gonna stop me from doing this. I was they obviously a did not see the total name. psychopath <laughs> when I was starting the company. Yeah. But I was just like, okay fine, you know, we'll bootstrap. And so we ended up bootstrapping for a year and a half um, and got to a point where we had a couple thousand businesses running on us and, and the dollars that were being processed across the platform were starting to get really interesting so that when we circled back to VCs, you know, a year or a year and a half later, or a lot of angels um, mm -hmm. made up our first round. Great. Even if they weren't passionate about beauty, they could look at the numbers and say, hey, this is, there's something here. Right. You know, I don't know. I don't know that much about the industry. Melody, I like you, but like, there's something interesting here in the data. Mm -hmm. So that's how we raise money. Wow. So how do you how do you bootstrap a tech startup unless you have a, co a technical co-founder? Do you have a technical co-founder in your back pocket or what's the deal there? Yeah, so I um, the first thing I did was built a working prototype. So I had a an engineer that I found on Craigslist mm -hmm. that built a prototype for me based on designs that I had uh, my best friend create for me for the site. Okay. Um, and he did that for equity, which was great. So we okay. did that for free. And, okay. and when I took those designs to 
one of my really good friends, Dan mm -hmm. Levine, who is one of the first engineers at Current TV, mm -hmm. and ever since I've, not only is one of the most brilliant humans I know and developers, but every week has always had different color hair since I've known him. <laughs> I like love purple, it. pink, red, green, like everything. Um, I, I took that prototype to him and said, look, I think that, that this is gonna be huge. Love if you work with me um, and be my co-founder. And he said, okay. And I was like, okay, oh. <laughs> cool. Well, I can't pay you and actually we're gonna have to bootstrap so you're gonna have to put a bunch of money into the business. And he's like, okay. Really? And I was like, okay, but um, so, you know, and I kept giving him all these reasons after right. he said yes. And he's like, look, I already said yes. Why are you convincing me not to do, do this? Wow. And I was like, okay, <laughs> let's do it. Fine. Absolutely. You want to meet tomorrow? He's like, yeah. Um, so it was really, that part of it was easy because we just have always had a great working relationship. We worked pretty closely at Current. Yeah, okay. um, and he's, he's brilliant. So he, he pretty much built all of Style Seat um, for the first year and a half. That's amazing. So how how long has Style Seat been operational then? He's been live for three and a half years. Three and a half years. Which makes us like an old granny in startup <laughs> years. Right, in San Francisco. Yeah. So since then, since that bit of funding that you got, have you raised another round or did you get profitable from there? Or Yeah, we've raised a total of uh, 14 million, um, which includes kind of seed and, and mm -hmm. also Series A. Our Series A was led by Lightspeed, who's amazing. Okay. Um, and has been a great partner for us as well as Chris Saka. Yeah. Um, was one of our first and, and has been our biggest, a huge supporter of the business since day one. And then what's next? I mean, you've got, you talked about your business model a little bit in monetization. Are there more layers that you're adding onto this? Absolutely. So we, we spent the first couple of years really being a valuable business tool for stylists and salons and spas. Um, and that 70% growth number we're really excited about. That's something that we, we worked nights and now that we have that, we just launched, a month ago, we just launched our first consumer app, um, oh, really? which allows consumers to discover, look, and pay for their appointments from their mobile device. It's really beautiful. Yay. We're excited about that. <laughs> and the next phase for us is really in becoming a true marketplace. So we focused on growth. We focused on supporting supply and supporting demand. And now we're really excited to take the leap um, in the coming months and become a true marketplace. So getting really good at driving new customers to our stylists and our salons. So tell me about what the difference is when, when you are adding the layer of becoming a market space, a marketplace mm -hmm. and what you're doing now. What exactly does that mean? What are you adding on to become a marketplace? Well, a lot of it is figuring out, you know, in the past it's been, how can we make these businesses more efficient? So, you know, in almost doubling their revenue in the first year, that's you know, cutting the time in half that clients wait in between appointments. Mm -hmm. It's making their schedule more efficient. It's giving them tips on how to grow. It's giving them tools like nice. email marketing and, and SEO so we can help grow their business. Mm -hmm. What we're really excited about is giving them an easier way to get more customers in the door. Because every other industry has had the ability to take out an ad, use Google AdWords. You know, there's marketing mm -hmm. and acquisition channels that you have in order to grow your business. And the salon industry hasn't had that. You know, they a lot of it is word of mouth, and they they haven't been connected to technology as deeply as other industries, and so they haven't had those tools. Um, and yet, they're business owners, they're entrepreneurs, right? They should. So we're excited about connecting those two dots. Oh, that's amazing. So really, it's going to be the the one stop, or it is the one stop for these business owners who, re, who are really trained in their craft. They're not necessarily trained in marketing and bookkeeping and all exactly. that. Exactly. And exactly. a lot of them are very small shops, right? And or they're not artists. solopreneurs. And they're you know, artists. These are people that choose to, they're passionate about their art and their craft. They're passionate mm -hmm. about, they've, they've chosen to make other people feel better about themselves mm -hmm. and look better every day. That, you know, and to touch strangers and to talk to them and have conversations and connect with people. And so we want to be a platform where they can focus on that and we can do all the nerdy business building, right. acquisition, retention stuff um, yes. to allow them to, to steer their life toward what they love. So here's a question just for tech founders in general who have maybe a SaaS product or a freemium product. How do you get users? I mean, you have an amazing user base. How did you get there? Well... It's funny when I talk to startups, I'm always, I always say, figure out your distribution as fast as you possibly can because when you can figure out acquisition and how to speed up that wheel, mm -hmm. you know, as it turns, 
that that's usually the hardest thing for startups and so focus on that we did not um, <laughs> we actually tried a lot of distribution channels and we found overwhelmingly um, when you think about it it makes sense that word of mouth is by far the, the best source of new business for us. Mm -hmm. So especially on the stylist side, stylists talk to each other, they're very social. Mm -hmm. um, and when you can get a brand new stylist to somehow find out about you, sign up, get their entire business set up with really easy, simple product and onboarding, and you can effectively grow their business in a short period of time, mm -hmm. they're gonna tell five people. Yes. You know, they're gonna go back to their salon, they're gonna say, I tried out this new product, I've already gotten new clients, and we've found by far, I mean, we've tried everything, that that is an incredibly rich um, source of new businesses for us. And those businesses are, because a friend is telling them and it's because it's helped that friend, they're high quality users when they sign up. So that's been that's exciting for us. So do you, I mean, then what do you do on your end for, for marketing that do you, do you get to sit back and say, wow, word of mouth is working, all these users are fantastic. Or <laughs> what you, happens what is those users come on and then they say, great, I'm glad that you can do these things, we want you to do more things, and then we want you to do more and more. And so we focus more on, you know, better supporting our users and improving the product and that has increased our virality um, and our K factor, actually. Yeah. So, so it it seems counterintuitive, but for us, it's been it's been it's the best. Nice. And and now that we've got, you know, we're starting to get to that point of critical mass. Yeah. Now, as we start to focus on adding more customers to the platform, and you know, which also grows the businesses of our businesses, mm -hmm. grows their bottom line. Then they're telling more people, and then those clients are loving it, and they're telling more people, and so you start to see network effects, and we're seeing that in a lot of cities already. Very, very cool. Well, I'd love to ask a little bit more about you and kind of this journey through this, <laughs> because this really is, am I right in saying that this is really your first startup? Yes. That's amazing. I mean, how many, how many successful startups have I seen that this is their first startup? Not very many. I, I don't know if I can think of one. I mean, do you feel like that is charmed or do you feel like you had the experience that you need and what what do you attribute that success to um i mean i think part of it is is just not <laughs> it's a hard question to answer um i had a lot of good mentors when i first started my business you know my first mentor was garrett camp um who's amazing and i started a bunch of companies you know as an incubator um my second mentor and investor in the business was Charles Kalanick, who started Uber. And I think what I learned from those two people, you know, Chris was in the mix at that time. There was, it was a good crew that I was surrounded by who taught me lessons like never give up. You know, you have to live in the future. Even though everyone's telling you no now, mm -hmm. you have no business starting this company. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why anyone should write you any checks. Prove them wrong. Go do it you know, figure out what you need to do and go execute and don't come back until you do it. And don't whine about it or cry about it. Like if you want to do something great, it's really hard. And I think when you're focusing on that and when you're doing that and when you're, when you're focused on every single task, you know, as much as you, you have intense focus on it, then it becomes easy. You wake up and instead of saying like, I want to build a great company today, you say, okay, today I have to recruit a technical co-founder. Today I have to launch my product. Today I have to hire, you know, a couple of engineers. And then it just becomes, and every every bit of traction you get, the, you know, the boulder starts to roll a little bit faster and faster. And um, your tasks, the magnitude of the tasks that you have to do every day changes, but the attitude and the way you attack it is the same. Right. So I I'm definitely attribute my sort of crew at the beginning of the business to teaching me that attitude and how to attack problems. Wow. So you talked a little bit before about how, you know, how difficult it is and you just said, you know, be prepared not to whine, by the way, and yeah. cry about it, but there are times where it is just hard. You're crying in your closet. I mean, it's, it's dark. There are yeah. dark times. Yes. Can you share one of those times with us that you've been through? Oh my God. I mean, there's so many. It just blurs into a crazy, ridiculous. I mean, it's, you know, I think as entrepreneurs, we look at this and we say, wow, I mean, she's charmed. But yeah. We have oh my gosh, stripes, charmed, please. You know? No, we, we were like the black sheep of startups when we were first starting out. Like, lady founder, just not like other 
you know, founders, especially that investors were used to seeing mm -hmm. in an industry that a lot of guys in tech didn't get, you know, they're not passionate about beauty. Mm -hmm. They don't know how much their wives or girlfriends spend on beauty because it's <laughs> part of the mystery. Um, and they, you know, what percent of VCs are bald? It's like double digit percents, right? So they're just, it's not even on the radar. They're like, I cut my own hair and everyone's like, we know. Um, and so, so we definitely weren't charmed. Mm -hmm. um, I would say having a co-founder you have a great relationship with, I mean, Dan is like my brother, my best friend, you know, from day one, our first conversations were, what kind of life do you want to lead? What do you want to get out of this company? Um, you know, what are you looking for in terms of, like, in five years, what do we want to look back and see? Mm -hmm. Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. And because we've been so aligned on that vision, every time there's conflict or shit gets hard or, mm -hmm. you know, like if I have to cry, I go into a room and I can totally cry in front of him and then he just pumps me back up and then we like get back into the room and like finish mm -hmm. the day. Um, or if we have a fight and we're in a room, in a conference room, like screaming at each other, which happens <laughs> like often, um, <laughs> You know, at the end of at, at the end of that conversation, we both feel good. We respect each other more than before. You know, we know that we're a stronger team because we think thing. You know, we hit um, problems in very different directions, um, but we are so aligned again in our vision that it, it it makes all those hard times better because you feel like you're you're going after the same prize. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really helpful, and also like have have entrepreneurs that you really trust and like good friends that are not in the industry that you haven't taken money from that are like your crew where you can like show up at their door mm -hmm. the bottle of wine and you're like crying <laughs> you can be like i'm having problems right now you know whether it's like raising money or employees or whatever i think it's important to have the outlet um because it's it's harder to have that especially as your team grows and as your business grows and and people look to you to sort of, uh, you know, help help them figure out their next step. Um, you gotta still, you gotta still have people you can go, yeah, be ridiculous with. You know? Yeah, you've got that support system. Yeah, and it sounds like, I mean, you really did carefully engineer, like you said, around the lifestyle that you wanted, around what you you were passionate about. You carefully engineered this business, and so that's what I see from the outside in is that that resonates so well with just you, who you are as a person, that you could not do it. And so that definitely attributes, you know, contributes to your success. I yeah, I, I do love the company. I yeah. think that the people too, that we have in this business and the community, like if you talk to like early stylists from the style seat, right. they'll be the first to tell you like, <laughs> these people are family, they oh, looked out really? for me, we built this together, because we really did and that's that's been, very much everyone's attitude with so the you company. listened to them obviously you listen to their well they're partners and you know it, it's like all right this is what we're going to do that's you know here's the different roles that we're going to play like yeah. let's build something awesome yeah. so you are i mean obviously you still have so much of your career and opportunity ahead of you you're a young gorgeous woman powerful <laughs> woman in san francisco i mean it is what oh, it God. is you know call it like it is um, that's amazing, and so I want to know. You know, there there are lots of outliers out there in our audience. Uh, those who are not necessarily like everyone else. You know, they're not just another tech company that is understood by all all the investors, etc. And a lot of women out there yeah. that we want to motivate and we want to say, hey, you can do this. You can create what you want as long as there's a need for it. Yeah. What message do you have for them um, from where you're sitting now? Don't let what's out there or any rules stop you from doing what you want to do. I love that message because, you know, it's something that I hear over and over again, just talking to the number of entrepreneurs that we do, is that fear is really a huge part of what holds people back. Yeah. It's really their own insecurities. And, you know, I think many of us think, well, to run a business, especially of a scale, this scale, we need to know everything about business, you know, about Oh, I totally thought the same thing. About employees, about all that I totally stuff. thought the same thing. And I thought that everyone who ever, ever started a company was a genius. Yeah. And like they from Harvard, Stanford, and yeah, they're just born to do it. And like, yeah. how can I even think that I deserve to be, you know, at the table? And one, like, I, I read this quote um, 
that says, I mean, it's probably so cheesy, but really resonated with me, um, which is, you know, you don't regret the things, you know, what, what is it? Oh my God, I'm totally butchering it. It's, you regret the things you don't do, not the things you do. Mm -hmm. And so I realized, you know, I read that quote, I remember reading it in the morning over coffee, and I realized, you know what, if I don't do this, I'm actually going, if someone comes out with Style Seed like company in six months, <laughs> I'm going to freak out, <laughs> like I'm going to be so mad because I'm obsessed with this, yeah. and I'm actually, I would be more mad at that moment than if I failed and everyone knew I was a failure. Um, and also, you know, I didn't start out to build a big giant company like that was the dream but I started out working with the most awesome people I know learning every single day you know getting I you know every single month it was like all right let's see if we can grow 50% this month from last month okay let's see if we can do it again okay we did it let's see if we can do it again yeah. let's see if now we can add these features and that features and when you wake up and you say I want to do this specific thing or that specific thing instead of waking up and saying like I want to build the biggest company it becomes less scary Right, right? it's just attainable. Just a bit at a time. Yeah. So how, who did you lean on for those resources, for the aspects really of the cut and dry business that, that you didn't know how to do? I have always, since the beginning of the business, had a mentor that I relied on mm -hmm. pretty heavily for what I needed at the time. So like before I started the company, it was Garrett, where I'm like, I want to start a company. And he's like, great, do market research. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, of course, you know, and then I'd go off for a couple of months and do that and come back to him and say, here's the record research. He goes, great, build a pitch deck so you can communicate it to people. Um, just like basic stuff, right. but really helpful, you know, things that you don't know until you do it. And then after we had gotten up and off the ground and we had launched, I worked really closely with Travis Kalanick. I mean, he worked kind of three days a week full time for like six months helping me figure out the pitch deck and refine and finesse it and figure out all of the business models and the, the analytics and how the back end would work in kind of these complex ways and like the business structure and the economics and the mechanics of, you know, the first time we went out for fundraising, he pretty much sent all of those intros and he put his name on the line for me because he said, look, I think that she's a true entrepreneur. Um, that was what I needed at the time. And then from there it was, Another woman, Jenny Leftcourt, that was helping me with a lot of the business and kind of scaling and partnerships type of thing. And then, um, you know, now I rely more on my board. So Chris Sofka is a huge resource for me. Justin Caldbeck is another one where I'm talking to these guys every day, but it's things like recruiting, you know, building up an executive team, which we've done over the past year, or figuring out huge partnerships like the L'Oreal deal, or figuring out... Um, a lot of the secret stuff that we're going to be launching over the next year. Yeah, I think mentorship is so huge and obviously with where you're situated and the associations you have and what you've done before, you just had a great suite of mentors to pull from. Yeah. Don't be, don't be afraid to ask people for help and to be, to ruthlessly seek those really smart people out because I, you know, you can do things in half the time or in a fraction of the time and way better with someone who's just done it so many times than doing it on your own. Yeah. And I see so many, especially women, who are like, I don't want to rely on people, you know, I want to prove myself and yeah. um, and get credibility, which I love to death. Yes. But so many times I'm like, girl, like this stuff, <laughs> is, you know, so many thousands of people have done this successfully. Let's here. Let me hold on a second. Let me just give you all my documents and oh, that's you know great. you know what I mean. Like yeah. I think it's really important both to reach out and ask for help from people, yeah. um, and also to give help to other people yeah, because absolutely. it's all an ecosystem. Yeah, great point. Because the entrepreneurial community is very giving, honestly. Absolutely. From what I've seen. So what what really has been your most rewarding moment? If you can define one of this whole journey. For you, um, there, like, there's a few. I think, you know, we did a meetup in Chicago, so we're gonna be doing more stuff in Chicago um, over the coming months. But a little bit ago, we went to a meetup, and all these stylists came. They're amazing. We had champagne. Like, we just, they're like, first of all, the most fun people in the world. <laughs> Second of all, you know, a woman came up to me and grabbed my arm and started crying and said, you know, I've been in this industry for 10 years and 
I haven't been able to do it full time except for when I started Style C. Mm. Because I have a family and I have to support them and I've always had another part time job and I, you know, this is what I love to do, this is what I want my life to be around and I haven't been able to do that full time until I started using your business tools. And that to me was like, this is real, you know, this is, this isn't just me and Dan like nerding out, yeah. you know, seven days a week and like, <laughs> you know, until midnight or 1 a.m. This is, this is actually affecting people. You know, there've been a couple of moments like that where it's like, wow, okay. Yeah. That hunch that crazy. you had, that need that you saw that came to life yeah. and you saw that it actually changed someone's life. I mean, what is better than that? It's crazy. That's awesome. It's crazy. It's wonderful. Well, tell us uh, where we can find you online. Obviously, styleseat.com. How can mm -hmm. we learn from you personally as an entrepreneur? Are you on Twitter? Um, I'm on Twitter, okay. MelodyMCC. Okay. I tweet a lot about like pop music and cool. non-business stuff. I should probably... We are humans. <laughs> Chris, Chris Sock is always like, just stop it with the hip hop. Like, be, you're smart all day long. Like, why don't you put that on Twitter? I'm like, stop. Whatever outlet. I know, it is. Um, Instagram and Melody and I think that's it, right? Yeah. What other, what other websites are people on? I don't know. Okay, well, Stassi.com slash Melody. Okay, right <laughs> on. We can find you there. And yeah. hopefully we can take a, a bonus video of this wonderful space and we'll put that on your show notes page. Yeah, please do. We'll, okay. we'll have to clean up a little bit before that. Okay. Kind of messy. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you're in the thick of work. We love it. This is what sure. we want to see. So. Just go to outliermagazine.co and you will see all the show notes to this interview as well as the bonus video and the links to everything that Melody is doing. So thank you for having us. We yeah. appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Yeah.